Hello and welcome to another Dragon Plus live stream. I am your host, Bart Carroll, uh, where we are discussing more of the content, the design, the development, and the running of your game, especially as it is featured in Dragon Plus, our online magazine. Uh, today we have two segments that we're going to be running, uh, one of them live with Doug Davison from uh, Fantasy Grounds. And the second one was the Adam Rex interview that we were not able to schedule live, so we pre-recorded that. We'll be running that a little bit later uh, at about 2.45. So uh, again, uh, kind of an extended Dragon Plus live stream today. We're going to be talking to Doug for uh, the majority of it. And uh, the theme for this week, as I am greatly interested in this personally as well as professionally, is learning to uh, run Dungeons and Dragons games virtually. And so uh, Doug will be teaching me to use the Fantasy Grounds uh, virtual tabletop in many ways. Uh, in addition, Adam Rex was uh, the, the great uh, author and illustrator who worked on the recent cover illustration for Dragon Plus issue 17, which came out at the end of December. So we were very pleased and honored to be able to uh, talk to, to Adam about uh, his work that, that went into the cover illustration. A few notes of uh, housekeeping uh, regarding our live stream channel. This had come up in the, the chat before we did go live. Uh, Mike Merle's Happy Fun Hour will be debuting at the end of the month. So look for that on Tuesdays starting January 30th. Uh, that will be going live uh, 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Pacific time, leading directly into this show, Dragon Plus. So again, Mike Merles will be starting on January 30th. Uh, in addition, uh, day before, uh, Mondays, Danny Hartel will be returning uh, with Craft Hags. And instead of uh, our hosting Danny, uh, she will be actually streaming from the D&D channel, so we're super excited that Danny will be coming on to the channel officially as well. And she's going to be doing a bit of an extended show now on Mondays from noon Pacific time to 2 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, this first episode, I think we mentioned last time, she's going to be uh, talking about the start to finish process for designing, buying supplies for, and making a costume for her personal D&D character, Scrummy. And uh, one more note. Uh, Encounter Role Plays Learn by Play with Will Jones and company will be returning to the channel and they will be uh, returning on February 3rd. So uh, a couple Saturdays from now, the first Saturday in February, uh, that first uh, Saturday, look for Will Jones and the Learn by Play crew. Uh, we're always excited to have them on the channel. They will be returning to their regular day and time slot Saturdays from 3 to 6 p.m. Pacific. Uh, yeah, I guess we're very we're very Pacific uh, centric here from from based out of Seattle. So uh, Greenwich time just confuses everyone here. So <laughs> uh, in other news next week on the Dragon Plus live stream, we will following Mike Merle's debut of the Happy Fun Hour. We will be also doing our second Dungeons and Doodles episode. If you had seen the first one, we tried that out as an experiment at the end of last year. We had Stan, Richard, and Emmy coming in here to uh, field some topics, draw some doodles and sketches. It worked great. We loved it. We were glad to be able to, to showcase that. They had a good time and they want to come back. Uh, we're going to be changing some of our illustrators from, uh, from episode to episode. So I believe this upcoming Dungeons and Doodles next week, it will be Stan, uh, Richard Witters returning, and Adam Lee will be joining as well. We're going to be looking to do that periodically uh, every six weeks or so. It was a lot of fun. It's a great time to showcase our illustrators' work. Uh, and in March, we're going to have some special guests in town, so we're going to be dragging them into the studio uh, as well. So we're, we're pleased to present Dungeons & Doodles next week. If you do have any suggestions for uh, topics, for questions, uh, game show style that you would like to see them take a crack at drawing, let us know. Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter or in the, uh, the chat room. Uh, at, at any time. Or, of course, through the Wizards of the Coast uh, Twitter as, as well. So that's the housekeeping out of the way. Uh, again, I'd love to get into it. So we're going to go straight to Doug Davison. Uh, he is, he's joining us virtually from Skype, thus the, the headphones. 
Uh, but Doug is going to be screen sharing his end of things so that he can drive us through uh, Fantasy Grounds. And, and again, this is, this is teach me to, to use and uh, run Fantasy Grounds. So I, I'm excited to, to, uh, to, to learn a bit more uh, as, as we go. So I'm looking over to Pelham to see if we're ready to screen share Doug. I'm looking at Doug is in our camera here. Are you ready to, to go with the screen sharing, Doug? Uh, hello. Yeah, certainly, certainly ready to go. All right, we're ready. So we'll switch it over to uh, we'll switch it over to Doug, and I'll stop pointing uh, wildly <laughs> into the air. <laughs> All right. Sure. So just wait. Hello, there we go. There's Doug. All right. Did uh, <clears throat> did we want to jump right into the screen share, or did you want to uh, discuss anything kind of? Well, let's, no, you're right. Uh, before we kind of jump into the screen share showcase and the digital tools, uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing a bit about Fantasy Grounds, uh, uh, let me preface this a bit for, for folks that are watching. Obviously, this is the D&D channel, uh, and, and folks are, are, pre <laughs> are pretty darn versed in the brand and, and, and more than likely versed in, in Fantasy Grounds. That said, when we do our live games throughout the channel, we are constantly asked some, some very general questions from newer and interested players. Uh, how do I get started? Where can I find basic rules to get started? Uh, where can I make a character? Where can I run games virtually online? Uh, this is a, a <laughs> true story. I, I was at the doctor's office this morning uh, getting a lovely cortisone injection into my ankle, and the receptionist was a gentleman who had played D&D, &D, wanted to get back into it, and we started talking about today's episode and Fantasy Grounds and how are there these great tools where you can run games virtually if you're your gaming group. Uh, nowadays, you're not restricted to the physical proximity of where to find players, or maybe you had a past group and you've dispersed to various locations around the world. Uh, nowadays, you, you, you've got Fantasy Grounds uh, and, and other tools that, that help get those groups back together. Uh, so <laughs> if, if I hadn't just introduced Fantasy Grounds for you, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but, uh, but Doug, who are you uh, aside from president and owner of SmiteWorks? What's SmiteWorks? What's, what's Fantasy Grounds? And, and where can folks start finding out information? Got it. Yeah. So uh, Fantasy Round, SmiteWorks uh, has been around since 2004. And uh, I am the second owner of the company. I actually purchased it in 2009 after being an end user who uh, really enjoyed kind of the, uh, the interface that had, had already been started. And so we've taken it from there. We've kind of grown, uh, grown it substantially. And, and you can play a wide variety of games with Dungeons & Dragons by far being the, uh, the most popular system that's out there, and with the fifth edition of Dungeons & Dragons being the most popular system. Uh, and so Fantasy Grounds at its core is essentially a, uh, a program that you would install as a dungeon master on your local computer, on either a Mac or a, a Windows PC, uh, or Linux, through, if you jump through a few hoops um, as well. And then your players would also download and, and, and run it, and they connect, and it acts as a peer-to-peer -peer application from that point. Um, so one of the things we see is people uh, predominantly use it for completely online game sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also see a lot of people that utilize uh, a lot of the functionality within Fantasy Grounds just as a campaign manager and for a local table aid to kind of keep everything there, to use use it to prep your game, to build out stuff uh, you know, in advance that you plan on having your players use, and then to just keep track of all of the note-taking that goes into a typical D&D game, like your party sheet. Uh, one of the things that I would always talk to people when we would be at conventions is, is there's always that one person who gets designated the party secretary where they have to write down every single item that they have and whether it's been identified or not identified and the things that they're hauling back to town to sell. All of that sort of stuff, that minutia, uh, we try to, to roll it in with easy-to-use tools so that you can just, as a dungeon master, you can say, all right, here's a whole loop parcel of stuff that you've, you've you know, uh, located mm -hmm. and just drop it in there and then they can you know move things around the character sheet if they want or they can go into town and they can just say sell everything at 50 percent and then divide the coins out evenly amongst the party so uh, that sort of functionality um, we've got lots of things like that we have calendar systems built in for um, for the forgotten realms for instance and for even for dark sun and greyhawk and stuff like that so if you want to keep track of time management within your game that kind of functionality is there so 
a lot of things that you may or may not use. I think typically most users might find that they only use, say, 60% of the application. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and they'll use a different 60% than another group might. So um, it, it's definitely expanding and changing in its usage. And, and a lot of where we direct our development always comes from our end users. And they tell us, hey, it'd be really cool if it did this or did that or whatever. Half the time, they'll build their own functionality into it and then uh, share that with us. So um, we had some people that built at one point a, um, a way that you could change which language you're speaking in. And it would actually write it out, demonstrate that on the, on the channel as well. So, um, you know, that kind of functionality, um, you know, we try to look keep our eyes open for, for that sort of thing and then, you know, share it whenever someone uh, allows us to, to spread it to everyone. So, um, yeah, so I can uh, dive right in if you want and, and kind of do a little walkthrough. Sure. Teach me, teach me fantasy grounds. That's, that's my goal here. And I apologize in advance. I'm recovering from a cold, so I'm a little nasally uh, at the moment. <laughs> so. You and, and much, of, uh, much of the world, I think, these days, we, we've got the, the flu going around. Uh, Wizards of the Coast as well, so a lot of, uh, a lot of tissues have been uh, hitting the trash cans. <laughs> All right, so yeah. what, what are we looking at right now? Okay, so yeah, so I'm doing a screen share uh, of, a, of the interface that you would see as a dungeon master. Mm -hmm. uh, and so typically you would come up with a, a simple screen where it would have a chat window here where you can just type in, you know, whatever you want it. It would just put little chat bubbles here. What I mentioned earlier is I could actually change it and say in Dwarvish, for instance, and say, uh, who goes there? And it would actually render that and tell me as a dungeon master which one of my players understood what I just typed in. Uh, <laughs> and then the players can also select from their drop down, and it'll give them a list of only the languages that they have listed on their character sheet. They can speak in, in those languages back and forth, and then only the other players can do that. So we see a lot of uh, we see that used a lot within uh, within the games that I've run, where certain players may have an entire conversation in Elvish that they kept separate from the dwarf player, and they may even be making fun of the dwarf or whatever. So it's it basically is is just like a troop of people kind of uh, you know running around in, in a fantasy world and and doing. Uh, you know, juvenile uh, pranks on each other like they would, <laughs> like you would expect. <laughs> like it, like everyone does around, like we do, I do around the table for sure. <laughs> exactly. And then you can use that for your monsters as well. Uh, and you can speak as your monsters and things, or you can have notes that are written in, in alternate languages that you hand out and then people can translate it. And then, you know, uh, it helps promote the role playing for your experts in different languages to be able to then share that with the rest of the party. And they may paraphrase it or they may leave out important details, you know, when they do that. So um, that, that's, that's one of my kind of favorite features that, that we've adopted from our end users. We also have um, this idea of our desktop decals here. and We can uh, cycle through those with each one of our, um, basically our different modules that we have loaded. We've, we've, typically grab some of the artwork. So here's some of the artwork from Bolo's Guide mm -hmm. that you can have, um, you know, as kind of your desktop back uh, background there. So uh, I happen to love this one because I'm a big fan of Knowles. So I, I tend to load this one up. Um, but you get a basic interface and there's a bunch of buttons everywhere. So there's a little bit of a learning curve to kind of get the, the feel for it. Uh, but at its, at its core, you have a character sheet. And I'm just going to open up uh, the character that you're playing today, which is Rag. Yes. Yeah. So and I'm, you'll I'm, see. Folks can't yeah. see my side, but I'm looking at the player interface side of things. We wanted Doug, obviously, to be running through the Dungeon Master side of things here. So, yeah, I grabbed one of the uh, pre pre made characters. This is this is Rag. Yeah. And and so basically, as a Dungeon Master, you can at any point in time pull up anybody's character sheet and look at it. So you don't even have to ask them, hey, hand me your character sheet, because those character sheets are a part of the campaign. And then when the player logs off, the other nice thing is that if, if you're not able to make it one week, I could free up this character and, and you could choose to allow another player to take over the, the role of your character while you're gone. You know, So if you have to leave it right before a major fight or something and you don't want to leave the party stranded by having somebody you know, go wander off into the woods uh, when you're fighting the big bad evil guy, then, uh, then you can let someone kind of do that um, and, and then run the character. Uh, so you'll have basically, uh, you know, abilities here with your your strength, your saving throws, all that sort of stuff. You can pick up a dice and, and then roll it into the chat window, and then it will share the result 
and and I rolled just like I normally do, which is a natural one to start off. So, <laughs> uh, you know, you, you have that sort of information. There's a lot of things kind of uh, buried in. So if I expand out like the, uh, the armor class section, it tells me how it's, it's compiled from my armor, my shield, whether I have full deck saving throw, whether I have uh, disadvantage, all of that sort of stuff. Typical character sheet type functionality, nothing really that uh, crazy here. Um, anywhere where there's a dragon head, there's a link that would tell you, you know, what that ability does. So uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's at a touch, gives you a good example of, um, you know, for instance, if I wanted to see what my uh, horde breaker ability has as a ranger, I can click on that and I can read about it. And then as you level up, um, you know, it'll automatically add in the things that you get at the different levels for you. It really helps. Uh, it's not a complete character builder, but it does um, help streamline the character building process so that you can refer to that as a player. Um, then you can keep track of your inventory. You can keep track of your encumbrance, and it does all of your, uh, you know, measures how much you're currently carrying. You can mark items, you know, whether you're carrying or not carrying it. Um, you know, that's all um, pretty, pretty basic sort of stuff. And then you, of course, have your ideals, your notes, uh, and then your actions is, is where you get into the real meat of it. So the actions is, is any of the items that you have marked as equipped, you can utilize those to roll damage. And you can either just pick up the dice and roll it. And then uh, I can drag it to a monster and it'll tell me if it hits or misses and will record the damage for me automatically. I can mark my spells as I use them. Um, again, I can expand and read about the full description of the spell or I can expand it further and I can do a, a ranged attack or a, a saving throw, apply the, the damage with the type of damage preloaded onto, the, onto that. So in this particular case, it's piercing. So if I do this against a character, against an, a monster that has resistance versus piercing, it'll take that into consideration uh, automatically. So I think the best way to kind of demonstrate that is to maybe just jump right in. I'll do a, a quick combat scenario. Sure. So I'm going to open up my combat tracker, and you'll see that I've got my three players here, Rag, uh, Ward of the Warlock, and Radabam. And um, I'm going to clear out your initiative. And just like earlier, um, when, I, when we were kind of going through this before, yeah. if you open your character sheet and you roll your initiative, it'll automatically sort you uh, in initiative order. So if I did the same thing for the other characters, um, it'll automatically sort them. So the players would typically run their own. But as a GM, I can even control the characters like if they've stepped away and they're not available. I was going to ask <laughs> about that. It looks like as the DM, you do have a degree of authority over uh, all the players, all of the characters, I should say, as needed. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of things that, uh, you know, when you're playing, there's a lot of automation built in that if you do certain things in a certain order of operation as a player, it automatically will tell you, when, like, like I said earlier, whether you hit or you missed or whatever. Um, but if a player messes up and forgets to do that, there's a lot of things where the DM can take over and help move the extra bits around to, to help, you know, keep the game running. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and grab real quick. I've got, I've got a, a map here. Uh, and this is a this is what a map will typically look like. This is the player version. And then we also have the DM version. So um, any of the maps, th these windows are expandable. I typically run with a uh, two screen layout and I have it stretched really pretty far on mine and I'll have a map taking up one whole part of it. Uh, a lot of DMs when they run in person can even hook it up to a TV and then have the map just really big on the TV for everyone to kind of uh, view together. Uh, but you can shrink or grow the entire uh, you know window size to fill whatever space you need. You can use the mouse wheel to, to zoom in or out within different areas and you'll see that all these little red push pins as I hover over them tell, tell me what happens in that area. And so here if I click on this section here, I've got some box text and I've got some DM text. I can just click on the button to share that with my connected players. They can read the box text and I can paraphrase it out loud. Uh, and then down below, if I have, um, here's a, a teleporter and a table that I can, you know, roll a random table that would take them to a different part of the map. If there's an encounter, uh, it would actually, you know, have that there. And I've got a list of all of the NPCs that are there. So all of the stuff for that part of the story will be linked directly into the map of that area. Um, in addition, you can also unlock it, and you can edit that, and you can make it your own story. That was the question I was just about to ask. Uh, you're, you're pulling up a map from, it's the, the Fane of the Night Serpent map from, from an official adventure. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this is, I'm assuming, this was uh, box text that had come in 
uh, with the adventure uh, adventure purchase as well it comes comes with the descriptive text. If I'm a dungeon master that wants to tailor the adventure for for my particular campaign for my particular players, add a few things here or there. I was going to ask how much uh, editability does that uh, des descriptive text have? Yeah, so you can change every single bit of it. You can completely replace any of the DM text, any of the box text. You can style it in the same way. So like. Um, to pull up this one example here, let me go ahead and unlock it. So I can just go directly in and I can just say, uh, instead of saying muffled sobs, I'll say, um, I don't know, um, quiet sobs or something like that. So I can just you know modify it directly in, on the uh, fly there. I can also highlight it, I can change paragraph type. So if I want this whole section to be a box text, I can change it to a chat frame. If I wanted it to have a speaker, I could say, okay, well, uh, I'm gonna have um, Boblin the Goblin uh, be my narrator here and read that. Now I can do that and now within the chat window uh, Boblin the Goblin is now saying that out loud. So, uh, And I can even go so far as to uh, you know change it and have him say it in Goblin for instance. So uh, <laughs> it's completely customizable. Uh, you can revert those back if you ever need to uh, to revert back to the original story. So that um, you know, if you made a mistake and you over edited it, you can do that. And I can also drag and drop my own story thing. So if I don't like this entirely, I can just build a story from scratch and drag it onto the map. You can pretty much drag anything onto onto a map anywhere, and it will leave a push pin that you can refer back to later. Nice. And again, I'm looking at the player side of things. So I'm seeing Boblin the Goblin come in with his bit of dialogue. As yep. uh, clearly from the from the Dungeon Master side, you've got a bit more. Of, of the tool set that's uh, visible to you. I made the mistake, I closed my map out. So if I am uh, yeah. interested in uh, jumping onto the map as a player, how would you start displaying uh, the dungeon itself to, to, to folks? Sure, so uh, what you do is you just pull up the dungeon. What I, what I typically do is, is that's a common thing, especially for new DMs, is that there's this big X in the upper right corner and people will always click that button. As and they will like, oh, I just shut it down. So. Uh, as a shortcut, what I like to do is I actually, when I have a map open, I drag the shortcut to my uh, shortcut bar down here, and then it just opens it back up where I left off. Um, it's also under your uh, images section. Uh, you can do it, or I can right click and I can just say share it, and I share the sheet back out with my players. And then any player that didn't already have it open, it just repops it back up on their screen, and then they can look at it. Yep, there we go. So now I'm looking at uh, this exact component of the map. There's yeah. our, our three-member party is uh, starting to explore the dungeon. Uh, and so as the DM, uh, let, I, I know this is for, for folks watching, this is a bit of an abbreviated introduction, but uh, uh, learning some of the tools and the uh, capabilities of, of the Fantasy Ground tool set, uh, creating the or modifying the adventure text and now running through some of the uh, actual adventure itself. How would that, what are the mechanics of that involved? So one of the first things you'll want to do with most maps is the players won't see every room. You don't want to necessarily show them every area there. So what <laughs> I've done is I've, I've clicked the unlock button on my map and there's a mask button. I can turn on uh, mask mode and then that actually will gray it out on your screen. So on your screen, it should be completely gray at this point. On my screen uh, right now, I see my th the three party tokens. Everything else is a bit of fog of war. Yeah, and so what I've done is I just now uh, drag a, a rectangle and I've now shared maybe this part of the map and, and maybe I, I shared that there's a door uh, ahead. Yep. And so as you say, okay, well, I've opened the door, then I can go ahead and just, you know, maybe share part of that and maybe maybe you can see a little, little bit off to the side um, as well that you can now explore through. So... Uh, from there, one of the other things I've done is is I've locked the tokens. So you can either allow the players to move their tokens freely, mm -hmm. uh, or you can lock the tokens, in which case uh, it will record the path that the player takes when they move. So if you wouldn't mind, take Rag and move Rag into the room, maybe um, over by you know the crate down a little bit to the south. You go into the room like, uh, like we talked about earlier. So mm -hmm. you just basically drag it over, and, and that showed he's moving 35 feet. So if that is an approved movement, then I can just, as a DM, right-click and say accept move, and you will move along that path. 
if for some reason there was a trap partway along the way, I may stop you prematurely and then we would deal with a trap situation. Uh, all right. So, yes, a subtle way of saying, OK, I enter the room. OK, exactly. How do you enter the room? Where are you going when you say you're going to look around? So if there is a trapped square, you'll know if the players did or did not step on it. Exactly. And so here I would then open up uh, and I could share with you the box text for that room. Mm -hmm. And now mm -hmm. there's an encounter um, with I forget how to pronounce this guy. Uker Lamu, I think is his name. Um, <laughs> so Uker Lamu is going to pop here. And so what I will do is I uh, pull up the encounter, and this tells me it's a CR6 encounter worth 2,000 experience points. Uh, and you'll see that there's these little check marks. That means because it's a pre done adventure, I've already preloaded where they're going to start out in the room. And so I'll drop that on, and by default, they will be invisible, but it will add them into my combat tracker and it will roll their initiative for me. So I can now mark uh, this this character as visible, and when it's his turn, I just click on the button. So Wardy gets to go first as a player. Wardy may move in and, and do some uh, attacks. I'm going to skip him for now, uh, but I'm going to have Rag go ahead and go. So Rag, uh, if you uh, open up your character sheet and you go to your action tab, you should have a list of actions you can do. And so uh, you have a couple options. You can, um, and I'm going to do that kind of simultaneously so the players sure. can kind of see this. Yes. So on my screen, I'm going to open up what the character sheet would look like. I'll let you drive and I'll look here on the back okay, end sure, of it. So yes, sure. I do so have the action it's... tab open. I, I can see I've got my, my, my daggers plus one is an option. I've got my longbow, not very good with, uh, with the, the, the serpent right on top of me, but, uh, or, or my longsword as well, that, uh, that are all options. So effects are one of the big key parts of, um, of fifth edition in general and, D and Dungeons and Dragons in general is keeping track of all these different effects that are going on. So as a ranger, you could do a hunter's mark and say, okay, well, this looks like a pretty nasty thing. I want to go ahead and drop my hunter's mark on that one. So you just basically drag and drop uh, the token on it. And now I've applied my hunter's mark to this particular character, uh, to this NPC. Mm -hmm. And so now every time I deal damage, it's going to roll extra damage against that particular character. Uh, and so now I can go back up and I can do my dagger, for instance. Uh, I could just maybe try to stab or stab with the long sword, for instance. I can pick it up and drop it on him, uh, and it would roll and say whether I hit or I missed. I could also control click to target him, and then if I'm farther away, it'll tell me you know the range. So if I'm actually farther, if I was back out in the hallway, for instance, I can hover over it as, as a DM, and I can see that down it's 15 feet away. Uh, and you could do, you know, maybe a longbow attack, for instance. Uh, in this case, uh, it did hit, and if I want to roll the damage, I just roll the damage, and it applied it, and it did the wounds for me automatically. Now, as a combat tracker, I see that that particular character has wounds, uh, nine wounds recorded, and then as he as he becomes dead or whatever, then I'll, you know I'll be able to see that and remove him from the combat, and then kind of continue on. Um, so. That's um, from there. Now I've got this, the NPC, the monster has a chance to go. I'm going to go ahead and put uh, Rag back in the bad location where he was. No, Rag. <laughs> so one of the things that's really nice here is that uh, this particular monster is a spellcaster in addition. So if I need to open up his full stats, I can just open up here and I can read about all of the spells that this particular character knows. He has a bite. Um, and then he also has... Uh, let's see, what other abilities does he have? Lots and lots of stuff that he can do, basically. Uh, and then the other tab, I can share the image and show you what this character looks like. So I can say, this is what it looks like, uh, you know, up close. And then you can, you can close that down whenever uh, you're done looking at the image. And then I can decide here, if I wanted to do one of my spells, you'll see I've got Sacred Flame, for instance, or I've got Shield of Faith. I could put that on uh, on on himself to give himself a, a AC bump, for instance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, or I could do a hold person, which would you know make a paralyzed effect, that sort of thing. So here, what I can do is is he's got all of my spells. I can click on him to read about what the spell does, uh, or I can just drop it directly on him. So if I wanted to do say uh, sacred flame, I could drop that on to your character, and it would roll, and it would say, oh, uh, you had a failure. In this particular case, uh, as I was mentioning yesterday. We've taken a little bit of liberties with, uh, we've stolen some things from 4th edition that we really liked because we think it helps keep the agency on the current active player yeah. uh, and yeah. speeds up combat a little bit. So what we've chosen to do is allow an automation to where you can force 
the roll of the saving throw by the other person. So that forces the automated roll from your character with all of your bonuses and that sort of stuff. Similarly, when you're playing your player and you're dropping spells on bad guys, especially like a fireball on a big group of 10 or so people, it'll automatically roll for those automatically. And then from there, it'll it'll do half damage, full damage, whatever. If you don't like that approach, you have all of the information there. You can just say, okay, Rag, give me a dexterity saving throw. And then whether or not you hit a 12, I would say, okay, well, yes, I've done the damage to you, so I can drop uh, the radiant damage on you, for instance. Uh, <laughs> well, it looks like I rolled a 1 for my saving throw, so I'm going to uh, vehemently uh, c complain. <laughs> yeah, but you only got 3 damage, so it's uh, all in all not too bad. Uh, and then when I'm doing my character, I just hit next, and, and then we go, we go from there. I think that character also had a, a bonus action. He could turn on these two minotaurs, uh, minotaur skeletons that are just kind of hovering in that area for you. Uh, but you see that they have vulnerable uh, to bludgeoning, for instance, but they're immune to poison uh, as well. So I don't know if, you, if Rag has any bludgeoning weapons. He uh, is pretty pointy. He's got his long swords, daggers, and uh, his bow. Yeah, so if we wanted to real quick just demonstrate what that looks like, I could grab an item here. Sure. I could grab some weapons, and I could say, okay, I want to give you a mace. So I'm just going to drag a mace over to your character sheet. He quickly uh, built so, that out of the containers in the room. Yes, yes. He grabbed, there was a mace laying on the uh, on the chest right next to him there. So yeah, he grabs the mace, he swings it at the skeleton next to him, uh, and <laughs> my my luck of rolling is horrible. Uh, there we go. Let's see. All right. So now he he has a magic bonus. That there lets we him go. go twice, right? DM. And there we go. So now it, it did. Uh, it recorded that he was vulnerable to it. So, so yeah, it's um, <clears throat> it kind of helps manage a lot of the stuff that you would forget as a player or as a DM oftentimes. And it says, uh, you know, a lot of times I don't know how many times we've had games where someone says, "Hey, wait a minute, why did I just roll with disadvantage?" Mm -hmm. And then uh, the system knew, okay, well that's because you were prone or you know whatever, uh, or you're sickened from before, and uh, and so it helps kind of keep everything on track uh, and then you can still always undo those things or you can manually decide if I wanted advantage on my next attack I just click the advantage button uh, and I do the same thing uh, and now it'll roll both and keep the higher uh, which was good because it looked like I dropped a uh, low dropped a one so that's not a bad, <laughs> bad to drop so we're getting the ones out of the way that's always a good thing in any game once it starts up just yeah get it right out of the dice Right, right. And like I said earlier, if you if you were to just roll the dice and say you forget to target, uh, let me untarget the guy so you're not targeting him anymore. Um, so if, if you forgot to target him and you did your attack, for instance, and you said, oh, I really meant to do, I didn't mean to target that one, I meant to target the, the Minotaur again, then I can just grab the result and drop it on and it tells me whether I hit or I missed. So. Um, and if you accidentally drop damage on the wrong thing, you know, you can undo the damage by just kind of right-clicking and, and uh, let's see where I can find where my damage is. Uh, yeah, so here I can right-click and I can take a half of the value, I can double the value, um, or, or uh, make it a negative value. And if I can drag that over, then it would actually heal up the character, heal up the NPC. So um, lots, of, lots of options to kind of... Keep, keep things going. And then the beauty of it, once you're done, is uh, you have this combat tracker. Um, I'm sorry, you have this, this encounter that we just ran. Right. And we have a party sheet. So here's the party sheet. Here's all of the experience points that we've awarded so far. So I can just drop this encounter into here, and it records a log of all of the things that uh, we've defeated up to this point. And then I, as a DM, I can just say award experience points, and it does the math for you and, and marks it as awarded on your sheet. And then you guys refer back to it later and say, hey, how did, you know, I missed last week, how did they get 10,000 experience points? And as DM, you can just follow up and go, oh, they killed five demons and, uh, you know, whatever, so. Huh, and how long does that stay with the, uh, with the party, that, that information? Does it it just... stays with it uh, throughout that entire campaign. So unless I go through and clear this out, it will just kind of keep a running log. It'll just keep kind of building up to it. Um, and then, you know, on your character sheet, it'll tell you, you know, what your current experience points are and what your target goal is. Um, and here you see, I, I haven't actually set it for right of and Wardy, but what their next level uh, level up would be. And then, you you know, you know, when your players are ready to level up, then you can, you know, kind of deal with it there. Uh, but yeah, that, that's the basics of combat. Uh, now on character building, one of the things that's really kind of interesting, I think, is that 
there's a lot of different books, a lot of different character options spread across a lot of different books. So Xanathar's Guide just came out. Right. It has more archetypes, has more sub sub races in there. And so if you happen to have uh, the player's handbook and Xanathar's Guide both loaded, and maybe you've got Bolo's Guide to Monsters, then when you go to build your character, uh, I'm going to go to PCs and just do, you know, build a new character here. And we'll call uh, this character, um, we'll call him Bart. <laughs> he sounds like so a winner already. Sounds like a fantastic person. So, uh, <laughs> you know, you would just set your basic stats, you know, roll them however, you know, your DM likes to do it. If you do point by or, or whatever, set that up. And then you're going to just basically grab a race. Uh, and the race, I could say, what race would you like to be, Bart? Uh, tiefling. A tiefling. Okay, so let's see. Uh, we just go grab a tiefling, drop it onto the race section, uh, and we drop on. If I happen to have dropped on like a, a, a gnome or something like that that has multiple sub races, it would actually ask me what type of uh, gnome or what type of elf would you like to be, and then you could read about those and select it as well. But the nice thing is that, uh, and I'm going to do one more here just to demonstrate that real quick. So the nice thing is that if I was to drag um, like an elf, for mm -hmm. instance, you can see I've got elves from a lot of these different uh, different books. So it doesn't matter which one of them I drag over. If I drop it on, it now asks me which one of these I want. And I could grab a wood elf, for instance, and I could read about it and say, okay, well, this is what makes a wood elf a wood elf. It has a different set of abilities. Uh, and I just mark it, check the box, and hit OK. And then you can see in the chat window, it actually lists all of these abilities that it's added to my character sheet. So now it's added elf weapon training, fey ancestry, keen census, etc. Um, similarly, if you're going to go and do the classes, uh, so let's grab a class. Uh, so Bart, you're a uh, tiefling. What, what class would you like to be as a tiefling? Warlock, please. A warlock. Okay, so uh, I'll grab a warlock, drop that in, and now it'll let you choose which two skills you have. Um, you can you know, read about them by clicking on the shortcut, select those, and now uh, which patron would you like? And you can see that it has... Um, the patrons from all of the different sources that I have yes. uh, available here. So let's go uh, with the great old one. The great old one. That's a great old choice right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so now it's, it's added those in, and then as I level up as a warlock, uh, or if I multi-class or whatever, I just keep dragging them over, and then uh, it'll keep adding, you know, more hit points, more hit dice for me. It keeps dropping on the new abilities that I get, you know, as I level up. Uh, and then if there's any other, like if you're a fighter and you wanted to choose which, uh, which path you've taken it'll prompt you at that point in time and you can choose whether you want to be a champion or, or whatever so um you know lots of different things there that'll just kind of help make everything easy then you drag and drop in your inventory and it'll add your actions and your tax for you spells you can do the same thing so here in the spells i can say i want to look at um you know a specific thing i want to look at warlock spells for instance mm -hmm. and uh and now i've got a list of my warlock great old one spells or i can just grab you know straight warlock spells here and you know, tab through them and, and grab the spells I want, drag it to my character sheet. I can I can limit it to show just like level one spells, for instance, and grab like charm person, car cause fear, and you'll see that it now uh, knows it would add the frightened effect with a concentration modifier, so that if I get hit later on, uh, then I might lose my concentration and the spell would expire. So. Um, Lots of lots of little bells and whistles there that you can, you know, play around with and, and help you know track your character as you're playing. So we kind of talked about it a bit yesterday. Uh, Xanathar's Guide to Everything are already out. That was released, I believe, November 10th on, on Fantasy Grounds. Uh, Volo's Guide uh, Volo's Guide was uh, made available earlier in the year as well. Uh, core rule books, uh, obviously, uh, very much uh, a part of the the, the purchase options and. Uh, uh, you were talking about uh, the the SRD material as well being uh, a component of, of some of the the access that 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 users would be able to have, correct? Yeah, yeah. And so uh, let me actually let's look at this. Drop my share here. Hold on. Uh, find my Skype window. No worries. Really quickly, while you do that, let me make a mention as well. If you're, if uh, if folks are interested in watching a Fantasy Grounds game in action, uh, and, and Doug, correct me if I'm wrong, but there is the Save or Die live stream that is taking place currently. 
Uh, it's Cody Lewis from Talking 20, Will Jones again from, from Encounter Roleplay and Learn by Play. Uh, that is currently airing Wednesday nights. I believe it's at 6 p.m. Pacific time on the Save or Die Twitch channel. So if folks are interested in taking a look at a uh, Fantasy Grounds live stream game, uh, take a look at, uh, at, oh, sorry, not Save or Die, Save or Dice. Save or Dice. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll make sure that uh, we get those links uh, up, up as well. Yeah, and we, we try to host also on our Twitch channel. It's uh, Twitch TV slash Fantasy Grounds. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also try to host games from other people that we know are streaming in Fantasy Grounds and and D and D. So uh, you know, check back often there. Uh, you know, get notifications of when we go live or when we're hosting someone else. So um, yeah, lots of opportunity to see other people game and play. And and a lot of the DMs that are running the games are very very open to questions. You know, if you're, hey, how did you do this in your game? And and that's the best way to learn how to uh, you know play some of these things is to, to see someone else play, see how they're applying the effects and what they're doing to help keep their game running. And that's one of the things we were looking to work with with Will Jones on, on the Learn by Play, hence the name, was having him kind of step away from the table from time to time to explain a little bit about the, the running of a game from, from the Dungeon Master side, what he was doing to create the adventure and run the adventure around the table. So, Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I've, in the meantime, I've pulled up the SRD. Uh, so it comes with the SRD for the Bestiary, it comes with the basic class stuff, which we just have in the SRD data that has like items and, uh, you know, like your weapons and armor, that sort of stuff. Um, and then there's a separate magic items SRD data as well. So you can load those up and that, that really does give you a lot of stuff. So it'll add it into the, the classes and the races section. Uh, here you can see I've got stuff in the Dungeon Master Guide and everything else. But if I pull up just the SRD data, you can see it does give you, um, you know, a, a pretty good choice of, of races. Now on the half elf, when I uh, see that, it, or, the, or the elf, it's not going to give you the sub races mm -hmm. if you don't have the other uh, class. It only gives you the single sub race, which in this case would be the high elf. Uh, so that's going to be how that's going to be a little bit different. Plus it won't have the same reference manual material, uh, but it does let you get in, build characters. You can use those and modify them, like everything else in the, in the system. If you wanted to make uh, like your own version and you wanted to add in your own sub races, you could pull up the elf and then you could, uh, you know, make a copy of it and make it your custom version of the elf, and then uh, unlock it and and uh, go through and change, you know, uh, what your what your special abilities are uh, and everything. So makes it makes it really easy to to load in like Unearth Arcana or or anything like that. And that's where I was going. I heard a little rumor that Unearth Arcana material might be. Uh, made available on Fantasy Grounds. It has uh, been appearing on D&D Beyond, another one of our digital tools partners. Uh, but Unearthed Arcana material uh, for Fantasy Grounds, that, that will be coming into the mix? Yes, we should have that out probably um, maybe in a couple of weeks before we get it completely turned around. But yeah, that'll be there. And then we'll end up having it come out pretty much uh, in lockstep with it, you know, when the articles come out. Um, you know, once, once we start kind of the production cycle of that, we, we get uh, to where we, we come out with it at the same time that it comes out in PDF or print or whatever. So Nice. Uh, so that, <laughs> that was 45 minutes, and it absolutely flew by. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, so, Doug, before we, we switch over to the Adam Rex uh, video, uh, interview video. I, I did want to to thank you uh, immensely for for coming on the Dragon Plus live stream today and and giving us uh, an initial walkthrough of the the Fantasy Ground uh, tools. Uh, that said, we I would love to have you back on to do maybe a bit of a deeper dive. A as mentioned, this is uh, sure. teach me Fantasy Ground, so now I know a bit more. Now I'm going to get my hands a little, even dirtier with the with the tools, and I'd love to come back and kind of talk through you know, some of the, the deeper ins and outs of, of setting up and running a campaign. That, that, would be, that would be super helpful for me and something I'd love to, to be able to present to, to the viewers as well. Certainly, yeah, I'd love to come on. I'd love to talk about Fantasy Grounds. I'd love to talk about role-playing games in general. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to, to be on, so I appreciate it. Absolutely. As, as folks mentioned in the chat, we were able to talk with you at uh, last summer's uh, Stream of Annihilation event, so folks might remember you from there. And uh, again, always poking around folks' Twitter feed, uh, we, we saw the many contributions you had made to Extra Life last year. So uh, on behalf of myself and the organization, thank you very much for, for that as well. Yeah, 
Great. Uh, so for folks that are interested in finding out more about Fantasy Grounds, about uh, playing around with it, picking up some of the, the uh, adventures, uh, if they're interested, where would they go next? How would they get involved with Fantasy Grounds? Yeah, so we have a number of different places. We have uh, a forum on fantasygrounds.com mm -hmm. where uh, that's kind of a good central location to kind of meet other people, look for groups, uh, you know, uh, hop in games, ask general questions about any one of the different systems that we support. Uh, and then also we have a Discord channel, um, which we have linked from our webpage as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you can go out to there. I think it's under, um, I, I should have this all handy. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think it's under, under our menu on our webpage. Is it, it's, uh, it's about, uh, you know, list of Discord channel there. So mm -hmm. you can go there. We also have a, another group called Fantasy Grounds College, which is a complete volunteer group, mm -hmm. which uh, has gone in and done deep dive training session so they can do hands-on training with you to teach you how to utilize various components and i saw them uh, a few of them in chat earlier too so uh, <laughs> they're very prolific they're very uh very super super helpful and friendly and uh and I, I think in general our community is one of the reasons why i bought smiteworks in the first place is is um you know i was a member of the community and it was a very welcoming friendly community and, and so it was it was definitely a core asset for uh smiteworks and for fantasy grounds in general uh, well, again, uh, Doug Davison from uh, Fantasy Grounds, president and owner of, of SmiteWorks. So uh, take a look, fantasygrounds.com. And thank you again for coming on the, the stream and uh, offering us your, your invaluable expertise as far as getting started with, uh, with the tools. Thanks again. Uh, and for folks watching, please stick around. We're going to be switching over. This was the interview that we had pre-recorded with Adam Rex, author and illustrator, and illustrator of the last cover for Dragon Plus issue 17. Uh, so this was pre-recorded, but we're going to run it now. Uh, coming up at 3.30, as always, Greg Tita will be in for D&D &D News. And at 4 p.m., uh, Chris Perkins will be running Dice Camera Action, of course. So. Again, 3.30 Pacific uh, for the news, 4 o'clock for Dice Camera Action. Uh, I'm going to look over to Pelham and see if we're ready to run the Adam Rex uh, video. We're good for that. And uh, Doug, I will bid you uh, uh, another thanks, and uh, I'll jump on email to, to follow up with a few questions of my own. So thanks Fantastic. again. <laughs>among uh, his, his many fine books. So Adam, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, again, we uh, needed to, to bump from Tuesday to Thursday, uh, scheduling snafus, but thank you for, for making time out of your schedule to join us, we appreciate it. It is really my pleasure. I, you know, me and D and D go back a long way, so I, I'm really happy to be on. I, I, I was going to ask about that a, a little later on. Uh, folks know you most recently for D and D with the cover for for Dragon Plus issue 17 available now on iOS and Android and at DragonMag.com. But of course, you have uh, quite an extensive history with not only Dungeons and Dragons but Magic: The Gathering as well. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I. Uh... I think I got hooked up originally. It was with TSR mm -hmm. uh, when D&D uh, &D was still with TSR um, sometime back in the 90s, probably like 95 or, or so, mm -hmm. um, maybe maybe even 94. I think I might have done my first job for Dungeons & Dragons back in 94. Um, and uh, I got brought on mostly to uh, replace Tony Dieterlisi on the Planescape books because mm -hmm. uh, Tony was getting too busy with children's books to keep up that schedule. And then eventually I got too busy with children's books to <laughs> keep up that schedule too. We all decamp for children's books apparently, but but I did a lot of Planescape books and a lot of other books and probably all of which are not in print anymore. <laughs> uh, nowadays on, on the DMs Guild and other uh, online avenues, you never know. I know there is a big uh, Planescape contingent out there as well still. 
Well, that's nice to hear, but it's also like a little unsettling to hear because I, you know, that was early in my illustration career, and you know, I did probably some of the worst work of my career for for you guys. <laughs> uh, sorry about that, but oh no, I, I was I wanted to ask about the Planescape in, in particular. There was sort of a distinct aesthetic that went into sort of the Planescape world, and uh, if if thinking back, were there sort of design considerations or constraints you remember being given about that or that the Planescape world sort of uh, impressed upon you or, or were you given more free reign to kind of do your own thing based on, on the game itself? Well, I don't draw like Tony Duralizzi, so mm -hmm. I, you know, I was definitely working off of a lot of, I think, his aesthetic, but I, I guess I couldn't help but draw it in my own way. But, uh, you know, the overarching thing for at least the interiors of the Planescape books at the time were all that they were all basically two color. They mm -hmm. were sort of a sepia plus black, yeah. which was, was actually nice. Um, I mean, I think it was it was just a a little uh, more engaging and inviting than just plain black and white illustrations. But it was also um, you know kind of a nice constraint. And I think a lot of a lot of good art comes out of constraints like that. Where I was doing everything essentially just in i think it was probably black ink and then one other color of ink and then you know through some mysterious process i don't really understand then the art team at uh tsr and, and wizards mm -hmm. uh, separated out those colors and printed them in the correct colors that they had in their their scheme but yeah i, I kind of just came on and learned how tony was doing it and and uh, jumped right in doing it roughly the same way and of course, your experience with Dungeons and Dragons as a player goes well beyond or well before uh, your work at TSR and Planescape, correct? Yeah, I was I was all first edition. I, I started playing when I was probably about 11 years old. So this would have been uh, 1984. Um, so, you know, that's why when I did the, the cover for Dragon Plus, really, it, it was you know, I was going back to my versions of some of the most iconic, you know, first edition monster manual monsters. Um, and, you know, I, I just remember this uh, yesterday. I think my first attempt to get a freelance job was with you guys. And I say really my first attempt because I was like 12 or 13. <laughs> uh, I, I drew a I don't think I've ever known how to say it. Is it dragon? It's sort of a half lion, half uh, dragon. You know creature. what? I, yeah, I, I want to say dragon as well. It's an O N N E at the at right. the uh, uh, the suffix of it all. And the conversation we just had last week was about the correct pronunciation of monsters as well. So there is uh, D and D Beyond is one of our tool sets where you can go there, and nowadays you can plug in. The monster's name and figure out okay well how do you actually pronounce a who again how do you pronounce why because right right before uh this podcast i actually just sort of googled it and tried to find uh i figured out oh, somebody on youtube has pronounced the name of every monster manual monster but i didn't trust what i was getting so regardless <laughs> i did a drawing of a dragon and sent it in i think i'm pretty sure i sent it in to tsr i'm not positive i did because i think on some level, I realized that TSR probably wasn't going to be impressed with a 12-year-old's drawing of, it was essentially a still life drawing of the plastic dragon toy right. that you were making at the time. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't, it was basically just, like I said, a, a drawing of a still life, uh, still life with dragon. And, but that was like the first time it even occurred to me that as a kid, maybe I could, do what these guys were doing for a living and uh and so you know tsr was the first people I, I was looking for in the 90s when i uh was taking work to the san diego comic-con and trying to to get my first freelance gigs so the uh the actual name of the the cover was uh self-portrait 1982 is that when you were, uh, before you were playing, were you still the uh, the younger brother who was able to get his hands on his older brother's material, taking a yeah. look at what was in there? For a year or two, I was fascinated with what my brother seemed to be doing with his friends, but I wasn't a part of it yet. So I was just grabbing the books and flipping through them and um, and just kind of absorbing everything and, and taking on sort of as like my own personal 
head canon of what uh, monsters were supposed to look like, yeah. you know, um, so much so that for years later, if somebody, you know, would draw a picture and say, this is a goblin, I'd be like, that's not a goblin. Like, the, I I know what a goblin looks like. Right. And it looks specifically like this one uh, black and white illustration from the Monster Manual from, you know, 1980. But, yeah, so I was sitting down with the, these books and I was drawing everything that was in them. And then eventually... I was invited by my brother and his friends to join their game, and I was actually DMing mm. uh, for them um, because I, I think looking back on it now, I was DMing because none of them wanted to, to do it. But <laughs> uh, but also, I think I had some imagination for it, so I wasn't I wasn't the world's worst DM, even if I never really brushed up on the rules as much as I probably should have. It, uh, Shelley Mazenoble, who works here as well, was always the goalie for her older brother uh, and his friends playing hockey because they had to shoot on somebody. So maybe it's a yeah. similar circumstance. You could have just put like a rocking chair in front of the goal or something. But <laughs> a life target works uh, works better. So <laughs> yeah, I also think that older brothers should come packaged with uh, starter sets for D and D because that seems to be a lot a way that a lot of people ended up getting into the hobby originally so yeah now exposure. i'm thinking about you know how i'm gonna try to rope my kid into it i have a five-year-old so that's a little young but you know i've been wondering if there's sort of a you know a gateway to to D D that is you know very short little campaigns that just basically kill the giant spider and and take his ruby kind of sure. uh, very short uh adventures that you could send a, a five-year-old and, and his cousin on well i'll give you two two uh products that are actually outside of the wizards of the coast family really quickly uh yeah. monty cook does no thank you evil which is a great sort of role play game Strange. starter game a uh, very story based and of course munchkin uh the card game gets oh, okay, folks yeah. familiar with uh, the races and classes a couple of years ago dungeons and dragons did do sort of this heroes of hesiod uh, very pared down role play experience for kids. It was, I'll send you the link. It was uh, very well received and something we should definitely look at uh, bringing back in a, in a way, shape, or form. It was a web web adventure. So, uh, yeah, I'd appreciate that because I I kind of I think he might be good at it. I you know he's a he's a little storyteller already. <laughs> So was that the hook for you when you started playing Dungeons and Dragons? You were thrown into the dungeon master seat, and and was there something evocative about that that you uh, appreciated? Yeah, I think I guess uh, I was just sort of wired for wanting to to tell these kinds of stories mm -hmm. anyway, and I think they appreciated that I would actually draw them something and show them who they were meeting or what they had found uh, on occasion as well. Um, so I think you know. You know, being self-deprecating, I really do think it started out as a, a group of boys who were all three years older than me who didn't want to be the DM. <laughs> but uh, you know, but they had me; they kept me on as their DM for a lot of years. So I think I must have been doing something right. So, making a wild supposition, was there any uh, skill set that you learned dungeon mastering the game that helped transition later in life to telling stories in in, uh, in, in your later career? Yeah, I, I think there must have been it just in the I, I think it got me to think on my feet more. And that makes me a little bit more of a, you know, I, I'm not a planner at all with my writing. And I wasn't a planner when I was a DM either. So the joy for me of writing is really just kind of jumping into it and and pouring stuff out. And some of it's going to be lousy and that's fine. And, you know, you find the art when you rewrite, hopefully. But um, I think, you know, I think that playing that game got me sort of fast at just, you know, trying a new direction and um, improvising dialogue. Mm. And, 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 and frankly, a lot of the same way that working for the company as an illustrator also, um, you know, really honed me as an illustrator to, to help me learn how to work fast and figure out problems quickly. And, and so that's, it was good to be thrown into the deep end as a, a fantasy game art illustrator for, Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons and some others that I worked for because, like I said, it really did sort of teach me how to solve visual problems quickly. Mm. Um, and as a result, now I think I'm the kind of person who can do, a, you know, two or three picture books in a year as opposed to, you know, you hear about other people who take two or three years to do a picture book. And, you know, that would be 
it would be hard to pay my bills if, if that were the case. <laughs> so if I can ask a little bit about, uh, so, sorry, if I, if I could ask about your process when, when you are working either on your own book or, or you're illustrating a, a, a script from, from somebody else, yeah. Are there, I imagine there must be unique challenges from one case to the other where you have to do the whole thing from beginning to end on your own. If there's a certain pleasure and, and uh, a challenge to that versus you're given the story from somebody else and you have to figure out those visual uh, executions that, that they might be looking for. I, I feel like most of the time it's roughly the same one way or the other mm -hmm. because I you know, people I think often assume since I'm an illustrator that I'm starting with illustration and then finding a story in it, which would be a lovely way to work. It just doesn't seem to be my way to work. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm thinking of ideas for stories. I'm sitting down and writing and I'm getting something written that is pretty close to what is going to be published eventually before I even start really sketching or, or working on it visually. Mm -hmm. And you know, because I don't seem to have the foresight as I'm writing to write things that would be really easy to illustrate. I'm, I find that I, you know, I have the same number and and difficulty of problems to solve when I'm working on my own manuscript as when I'm working on a Neil Gaiman manuscript or a Drew Daywalt mag manuscript or a, a Mac Barnett or whoever it is. So, so yeah, I'm usually starting with up bracketing certain things, deciding, okay, that's probably a page, this is a page, here's a two-page spread. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, you know, I dive in with a lot of really messy, you know, inscrutable little thumbnail drawings of the entire book that probably, I mean, I show these thumbnail drawings when I do like school visits all the time and the kids can't tell what they are. And <laughs> I think it's great. I think it's great to be able to show the kids that like, look, this is garbage. Look at these garbage drawings. Like, <laughs> but that's where I start. And then that garbage drawing then gets refined and maybe gets refined another step more before it turns into something that feels more like a finished sketch that, you know, along with all the other finished sketches then get kind of put together into one uh, package with the text and sent off to my editor and, and my art director at the publisher for, for scrutiny. And, I at least you're yeah. saying that about your own drawings, as opposed to you know grabbing the kids' drawings and this is garbage. <laughs> well, yeah, but you know I show them my, I show them my stuff that I made too when I was their age. I, you know if I if I go to a school and talk to them, I'm showing them slides of drawings that I did when I was four years old or six years old, um, which I think probably look a lot like their four and six year old drawings too. Um, you know that there's something there's just something about kid drawings that. You know, my messy thumbnails are not like their kid drawings. Mm -hmm. like, like kids might not draw everything correctly, but they draw everything perfectly wrong. <laughs> I, have a, you know, I have a four and a half year old and I'm watching him learn to draw. Yeah. And that's uh, very, very true. Yeah, that's the way I feel when I look at my old drawings. And that's the way I feel when I'm looking at my five year old drawings where it's just like, that's not, you know, it never would have occurred to me to draw it like that. But that's just, that's just perfect, like, you know, you, you couldn't change a line. The whole thing would fall apart if you did. So kid drawings, I think, are kind of a, you know, a thing unto themselves. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking to kids, when you're when you're working with them, do they have questions about how do I draw? How do I draw? How do I draw this? Or, or do you sort of just give them some uh, creative ideas and, and let them go at it? What what sort of questions do they have for you? They don't usually ask about how to draw spe specific things. Um, and if they did, you know, I think I, I think there is sort of a childhood idea, maybe fostered by all the kind of drawing books that you get, where it's like, well, okay, here is the step-by-step -step process to draw SpongeBob SquarePants. Right. Uh, when we were kids, we had these books of like, you know, here's how you draw Charlie Chaplin, here's how you draw a horse, and you know, you can follow those steps and you can draw exactly one pose of Charlie Chaplin or one you know, profile picture of a horse. And so I, you know, I think I do try to, to get across that that's not really how um, people really learn to draw, like learning to draw is learning how to see things as they are mm -hmm. and not see the symbols in your head that are trying to replace the things that are right in front of you um, in, in your consciousness. But, but nonetheless, I feel like the main Thing that I'm trying to impart on kids, kids who want to draw and kids who want to write stories is just that they have to give themselves permission to do it badly. Mm. 
Uh, and, and I think that's the thing that kids don't get. They, especially with the arts, even adults I talk to, they really want to grab hold of this idea that it's, it's some innate talent that you're born with and you're lucky you have it. And so like, okay, maybe I was born with a little bit, but that little bit plus 40 years of you know, practicing is the reason that I'm doing what I'm doing now. And, and it's, it's funny how often uh, people don't really want to hear that. They, you know, maybe they don't want to know that it's a lot of hard work because then that means that they could do it themselves if they were willing to work hard. But, the, the 10,000 hours sort of uh, yeah. philosophy of, of learning a skill and, and being able to have even artistic skills with enough time spent uh, going into it. And I try not to mention the 10,000 hours thing specifically to like seven year olds because I don't want to crush their little hearts. But, <laughs> but I do want to tell them that, you know, everybody starts out uh, badly. A lot of writers, like successful writers, their first draft is still garbage and, and uh, you know, I go through several drafts myself, but you know some writers I admire. I've talked to them, and you know they're writing forty drafts of something before they think it's ready. Mm -hmm. So their first draft is terrible, and they're just trying to get things out onto the page, and then they can go back and figure out what's terrible, so they can take the terrible stuff out. And and that you know I don't think kids are necessarily encouraged to think of it that way. So I'm hoping that by spreading that, that I'm giving them something valuable, that I'm giving them a gift that tells them that, no, we don't know how to do it either. None mm -hmm. of us know how to do it. Every time we sit down, we are figuring out how to do it again. And we make mistakes and we just learn to refine them. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I think that's a good case for, for a lot of things, including Dungeons and Dragons, just kind of bringing it around to that as well. When folks have questions about uh, dungeon mastering or even playing the game, a, a lot of the trepidation is that I think I'm going to do it wrong. Uh, and so it's like, no, just, just go ahead and, and uh, have at it and, and get some skills and experience doing it, doing it and uh, and don't worry about doing it so wrong. Just uh, have have fun doing it and, and learning along the way. So, yeah, that's the way I that's the way I DM'd. I think I it didn't necessarily matter whether or not I knew all the precise rules for grappling or whatever. It was it was just a matter of like, am I am I sending them off in an entertaining direction, and, mm -hmm. and do I seem like I'm being fair about it? Right. You know. And, you know, am I encouraging us all to tell a story together as opposed to, you know, looking for ways to make them die? And <laughs> as long as it's the former, then, you know, I think you can get by as a, a DM as long as you don't have, you know, a very, like, pernicious rules lawyer in your, your group that is, you know, trying to tell you that you're doing it wrong. <laughs> right. Well, that's, a, that's another lesson for, uh, for, for groups is uh, dealing with uh, various personalities along the I way. I never had that guy, so <laughs> I was lucky. I, I don't think any of the people that I played with knew the rules any better than I did, so they, they couldn't come at me from a, a place of knowledge anyway. But they, luckily, I, I never, I've never, in any of the groups I've played with, I've never, I've never had that kind of person. Uh, so again, going back to Dungeons and Dragons, the the cover for uh, Dragon Plus issue seventeen, self portrait nineteen eighty two, that was part of a um, a charity project, if I'm not mistaken. That was uh, uh, an ebook that you had helped create for the Save the Children Foundation. Yeah, it's a book called Beginnings, and it uh, it has a lot of great artists. A guy um, a guy at DreamWorks. Um, decided to put it together. So he was pulling a lot of DreamWorks people that he knew and, and uh, some other people from all different corners of, of the illustration world. And he put together uh, an electronic book that would be sort of a giveaway to anybody who, who donated to Save the Children um, under his banner. And the, the book was called Beginnings, and the, the prompt for the book was basically just to ask all the illustrators what inspired you when you were a kid and uh, and so I, you know, I was determined not to overthink that. The very first thing that I thought when I read that in his initial email was, "Oh, first edition D and D, um, that's what I ought to do." So, and that was that was just uh, a complete joy to work on that illustration. I think I that's the most fun I've had doing a painting, you know, for years. So, just 
going through, I found an, a PDF of the entire first edition monster manual uh, and just going through there and just making a list of all the different monsters that I could have put in it. Um, a list that was very long and had to be called down, but <laughs> you know, it was, it was really a lot of fun working on that. We, we just showed a, a picture of it on the, on the screen as well. I don't think you're seeing what we're seeing, but we, we showed the, the cover as you were speaking with the uh, owl bear and the beholder taking a look at it. And so uh, we're, we're, we're privileged and, and uh, very pleased that, that you were willing to work with us on uh, Dragon Plus as well. So thank you for, for the cover illustration as well for our use of that. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm glad that I was just glad to have another opportunity to show it to the kind of people who are really going to appreciate it because, you know, who knows who's buying that uh, charity book. It could be a lot of people who are very bewildered by my particular contribution to it. <laughs> but I know that, you know, your readers obviously will know where I'm coming from. Absolutely. Uh, if I can ask uh, upcoming projects that you might be working on, I know that uh, Are You Scared? Darth Vader has been announced. It's on uh, Amazon at the moment, uh, for available for pre-order. Uh, so would you be able to tell us a little bit about that or, and other things yeah. you might be working on? Yeah, I think that's the main one I can tell you about. It. Uh, uh, I was very lucky to have Lucasfilm just approach me. Somebody there was a fan of... I've done a couple of picture books about monsters. Uh, you mentioned one at the top, uh, Frankenstein Makes a Sandwich, and then I have another one called Fran Frankenstein Takes the Cake. <laughs> and uh, over at Lucasfilm, they were uh, thinking about trying to come up with a essentially a, a Star Wars Halloween book. And so they asked me if I had any ideas about what that would look like and be like. Um, and I had no ideas, but I told them that I did. And then I <laughs> thought of ideas because, of course, I want to do a Star Wars book. Uh, you know, I'm 44 years old. I saw uh, Star Wars, you know, back then it was just called Star Wars, but I saw A New Hope in 1977 in the theater. Uh, I barely remember it, but I did. So I, uh, I eventually came up with this idea of, like, I just wondered what Darth Vader himself would be scared of as, as obviously just, like, the the universal monster of the Star Wars world, like, you know, what what would he be afraid of? Um, so it's sort of changed over time. It got, it's gotten away from being as explicitly a Halloween book, but uh, the book is kind of a conversation between the book itself and Darth Vader. The book keeps throwing things at him, like, uh, are you scared, Darth Vader? It's, you know, it's midnight. That's there's a full moon, Vader says, that is no moon, because it's actually deaths are in the background. But then, you know, well, if you're not scared, how about now? And then, you know, a wolfman jumps out. Uh, Vader says, what is that? Is that a Wookiee? Mm -hmm. No, it's a wolfman. Are you scared? But Vader isn't scared of a Wookiee, because, you know, Vader, Vader's wearing armor. So uh, all of these sort of classic monsters get thrown at him, uh, a vampire and a, a witch and a ghost. Um, uh, until finally the book just kind of has to give up at the end. And, uh, but, you know, I don't know what to say and what to reveal, but then in the process of giving up, the book finds what Vader is really afraid of. And, um, you know, I end up humiliating Vader just a little bit by the end of the book and allowing the reader, you know, the kid that is sitting in the lab reading this book, allowing that kid to sort of humiliate Vader a little bit too. So we'll leave, we'll leave that sense of mystery, but he is, af he is afraid of something at the end of the book. He is, yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, that is coming out, uh, I believe, later this summer, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, uh, I think it's July. July, so take a look for uh, what, are, oh, are you scared Darth Vader? Uh, yep. We've got a picture of it, uh, the cover uh, from, from Amazon up on the, the screen as, as well. So if uh, folks are interested in finding out uh, more about yourself, connecting with yourself, how might they get in touch with, uh, with Adam Rex? Well, I do have a website that I never update. That is adamrex.com. <laughs> and then on Twitter, uh, which I spent way too much time on, um, I'm Mr. Adam Rex, M-R-A-D-A-M-R-E-X. Um, so find me there and say hi. Uh, absolutely. So uh, again, we, we appreciate the time out of your schedule for, for talking with us and even more so uh, the work that went into your cover for Dragon Plus issue 17. Uh, well, thank you so much. Absolutely. So again, take a look at AdamRex.com or at, uh, at Mr. Adam Rex on, on Twitter. So thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Welcome.